you glad to be in the house of the Lord on Liberty Sunday? Come on, let's celebrate Jesus today. It's going to be a great day. It has already been a tremendous time. Let's welcome all of our live streamers. Everybody say, what's up? Good to see you guys. So glad that you joined us today. Hey, it is Liberty Weekend. You know, we've been doing this for the last five years, and our goal is to create some space for God to move as a result of the generosity of this church. You know, one of the core values of our church is to be generous, and that's what this Sunday represents. And, you know, we have five initiatives that we want to accomplish. We want to dig four wells and build four churches in India through a partnership with Joyce Meyer. We want to do some drawings, some preliminary drawings for our children's facility that's going to be located right over here beside us. We need some more space. How many of you know kids are not the future? They're right now. Come on, they're right now. Our kids have a very strong call on their life. We want to build four campuses around the area. We want to work towards the development of four Freedom House churches around the area. We want to, we want to have a, more, a stronger digital footprint. We want to expand our ability to reach through the airwaves and through the internet. Uh, we have people that are watching all the way from around the world, Asia, China, Japan, Australia, everywhere. I mean, it's just amazing to see. And so that's what this weekend is about. You know, I love, I love the, 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 what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4, verse, and this really sums up what Liberty Weekend is all about. You know, when Jesus came on the scene, right when he started his ministry, he got up in, in church, in the synagogue, and he made this statement. He was quoting Isaiah 61, and he said this. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. How many of you know that that same Spirit that was upon Jesus is upon you? How many of you know that? How many of you know that the same, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you? It's the one that leads us. That Holy Spirit leads us. And he said, he said this. He said, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And I love this statement. To proclaim liberty. Everybody shout liberty. liberty. Come on, say it again. Say liberty. That means freedom. I think that's a good name for a church, freedom. Just, just saying, you know. If you didn't know that was the name of the church when you came in today. But anyway, anyway, liberty. It, 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 to the captives. I know each one of us knows somebody who needs freedom. Needs, needs freedom from the captivity of an addiction or freedom from the captivity of, of, of maybe some tough times in a family or, or a marriage. Or, or maybe, maybe you, you, you are related to somebody that, that needs freedom. Some freedom. Let me tell you, today creates space for God to move. You just really never know what God can do as a result of your generosity. And so we're, we're finishing up this series, one of many, with this message I want to call, You're the One. Look at your neighbor, point at them and just say, you're the one. Look at, look at one other person, look at them and say, you are the one. Turn around behind you, point at them, right in the, right in the face, say, you are the one. You're the one. I want to start off today by talking a little bit about history. In 1930, really for 1930 to 1945, in my opinion, were the darkest years in human history. It was during World War II, and it was the Holocaust, where, you may not know this, it was, there were 9 million Jews that were located in Europe. And of those, 6 million died in those 15 years. Gruesome deaths. Just to put that in perspective, that would fill up Panther Stadium 82 times. 82 times. That's how many people were killed. But you know, there was some, some light that happened in the middle of that horrendous time. And it, it came through a man by the name of Oscar Schindler. Matter of fact, Steven Spielberg did a movie called Schindler's List. And it was made from a book called Schindler's Ark. You may not know that, but he got a he got a copy of the manuscript of Schindler's Ark, and he decided to make a movie. Matter of fact, he didn't feel qualified. Spielberg didn't feel qualified. He tried to get other directors to do the movie, uh, really depicting the entire life of o Oscar Schindler, but nobody wanted to do it, and, and Spielberg did a phenomenal job. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, I, would, I would encourage you to watch it, but not with your kids. And if you are faint-hearted, it's a tough movie. Maybe watch it on television before you watch it via video, because it is a tough movie, but it is a true story. And it's all about the life of this gentleman named Oscar Schindler, who was born in 1908, 
And he was a businessman. He was a businessman in Germany. He, he opened business, but he also failed many times. He went bankrupt at least three times, and he became a spy for the German government. He was thrown in jail, but when he got out of jail is when Adolf Hitler began to invade Europe and kill and just, uh, just horrible murders the innocent Jews that were there located. One particular area that many of the Jews were located was a place called Poland. And as he... As, as, as the Nazis began to overtake Poland, Os Oskar Schindler was given an opportunity to start a factory. A factory to make ammunition and different wares that people could use during the war. And he employed approximately 1,200 Jewish people. Well, in the area, which was called the Graskow Ghetto, Schindler witnessed one of the most horrific I mean, just horrible murders of thousands upon thousands of Jews, innocent Jews. And something shifted in his heart. So much so that he began to use his wealth to employ his own personal wealth to get as many of the Jews out of the concentration camps, out of these, these Holocaust ghettos to try to pull them so he could employ them to eventually move them out of the country. Come on, somebody say, you're the one. Look at your neighbor, say, you're the one. You know, all it takes is sacrifice. That's all it takes. All it takes is us recognizing what that gentleman said to Oscar Schindler. He said, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. What a powerful thought to think that what I do, maybe, maybe for us it may seem so insignificant, but in the realm of God's kingdom, it provides so much significance for somebody to be changed. Whether it's here in Charlotte or, or whether it's around the world as, as we do things in different parts of the world and in and, and Asia and, and different parts of Latin America as, as God leads us as a church. You know, I think it's important to recognize the power of our generosity. Matter of fact, if you want to open your Bibles to, to the book of Philippians chapter 4, I want to look at one particular church that understood the power of their generosity. They understood what it meant to change one life. See, there was this guy by the name of Paul. Paul was one of the greatest missionaries. He went around the world after God knocked him off his horse, changed his name from Saul to Paul, and he started traveling around, and he started churches all over the world, all over the known world. And one particular place was an area called Macedonia, where he started a church in Philippi. Philippi was an interesting place. It was the first fruits of Europe. It was the first church that was planted in Europe. And they understood something about their generosity. They understood the power of of giving, the power of sacrifice, the, the power that if they, if they just gave. And so they recognized that this guy, Paul, was expanding God's kingdom around the world. And so they started giving. Matter of fact, they are mentioned over five different times in their generosity. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, we, we kind of we kind of dig into this, this one passage that you know if you've been around for any length of time, there's two verses that I'm going to read to you that you're very familiar with. But in the context, these verses take on a whole new meaning. Matter of fact, when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippian church, he was arrested, he was in jail, and he was writing this letter specifically as a receipt for their offering. That was the whole purpose of the letter, is to let them know what they had done, and they didn't even realize why they were doing it. He was providing so vocabulary around the why behind their generosity. What Paul was doing was talking about the blessing that comes upon the giver. Are you here today? You know there's a blessing for you. There is something significant that God does in our own lives when we sacrifice, when we give, when we are generous. We are creating space for God to move in our midst. The Philippian church was one of the poorest churches, but yet even in their poverty, they still gave. So it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or whether you're not wealthy. It really comes down to our sacrifice. It really comes down to the leading of God in our life. And like I said earlier, I believe that if we just trust God and do what he tells us to do, then we will be able to meet every one of the initiatives that God wants us to do. Amen? And so look at verse 10 of, of Philippians chapter 4. It says, but I rejoiced in the Lord. Remember, Paul is writing this. He's in jail. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. They wanted to give, 
but they didn't have the opportunity. They didn't have the funds to give. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, everybody say learned, in whatever state I am to be content, everybody say content. Matter of fact, if you have a Bible, underline that word content. We're going to come back to that in a minute. I know how to be abased, or I know how to live humbly, and I know how to abound, or I know how to live in prosperity. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, I know how to, do, I know how to live when things are going good, when the market's doing good, when my house is doing good, when I got money in the checking account, but I also know how to live good when things aren't going so good. When I open the checking account and I'm wishing some money there. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. We've all been there. He says, everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. We know this verse, verse 13. Let's read it all together. Ready? One, two, three. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We know that one. Nevertheless, we've probably read that one. I know I read that one a lot in college. Come on, somebody. Right when I was getting ready to take the test and I didn't study, I can do all things. It didn't work, though. I just, that, that verse didn't work for that. I even, I'll tell you this, if you're in college, sleeping on the book doesn't help. I've tried, and even if you open it up and sleep on it, it still doesn't work. I've tried to play the audio, and it doesn't work, so even when I'm sleeping. Nevertheless, you have done well, verse 14, that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, everybody say no church, shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. No church, but you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once. And again, two times for my necessities. Not that I seek, this is an important verse, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. See, the whole purpose of this letter from Paul to the Philippian church was to let them know what their gift did for them. Not so much what it did for Paul. Verse 18, indeed I have all in abound. Remember, he's in jail. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Now, we know this verse too, right? Verse 19. So let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I know you've read that one before. I know we've said that one before. As we open the checkbook, and it has the maybe negative... And my God, maybe looking at the bills when they come in as we're going to the mailbox, and my God shall supply all, and we, we put my, my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We've all quoted that one, right? Verse 20, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever, amen. See, there's something that the Philippians knew. They didn't even realize that they knew it, but that they knew about generosity. I want to tell you a couple things about, about generosity. First of all, this is what the Philippians understood, that they made generosity a priority. And that's what we need to do as the church. We need to make, or even, let's just take it down another notch, individually is we need to make generosity a priority. Now, how do I know that they did this? Or better yet, why did the Philippian church do this? Why did they, why did they make generosity a priority? Well, let's go back and find out how they started. How did the church start in Philippi? Well, in order to do that, we got to see where Paul went. And we find out, I don't want you to go there, but just really quickly, we find that they started in Acts chapter 16. Remember, Paul and Silas, they got arrested because they cast the devil out of this girl. They kept following him around. They cast the devil out of her. They got thrown in jail. They were singing songs in the prison. As they were singing around midnight, they started singing songs. Remember the story? The Bible says that the prison doors opened. All the chains of every prisoner that was in there were released. Very important. Not just Paul and Silas's. Come on, somebody. When you start praising God, not only do your chains fall off, but everybody around you, their chains fall off. And so... so the jailer who oversees the jail runs in. He's about to kill himself because he's just witnessed a miracle of God. Paul says, stop, don't kill yourself. It's okay. This is a move of God. We're all still here. We didn't leave. You know what happens next? The jailer takes Paul and Silas to his house, 
cleans them all up. The jailer and his whole family get saved. There is the birthing of the Philippi church. See, the reason why the Philippian church made it a priority to be generous is because they knew the generosity of God in their own life. They understood that their chains had been broken off. They understood that they had been released from their prison. I don't know about you. I've been in some prisons in my life. I'm not... not, Physically, but spiritually. I've been in some prisons. I've been deal- I dealt with alcohol for many years of my life, but God set me free. I dealt with problems, in my- but God has set me free. How much more should I be generous because of what God did in my life? Are you guys here today? Are you here today? Has God done something in your life? I think we could probably line everybody up and spend the rest of Sunday going through the, uh, the times that God has changed your life. You say, oh, I don't know. I bet you if we dug a little bit, we could find that God moved in your life. How much more should we pray that, believe that, give towards that in regards to somebody else? You know what it feels like to be set free? You know what it feels like to be outside of the prison? The Philippians understood that. See, when I make generosity a priority, I experience the power to be content no matter what we face. Paul said this. He said in verse 11, he said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, I've learned that in whatever state I am to be content. What does content mean? Content means that external circumstances never affect my internal peace. I think I will. (laughs) Content means external circumstances. The things that are going on around me never affect my internal peace. You can throw anything you want at me. I'm content. I have the peace of God on the inside of me. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. And then he says verse 13. Verse 13 isn't so I can climb higher mountains. That's not what I can do all things through Christ he's talking about. He's talking in the context of being content. Whatever the world throws at me, whatever the devil throws at me, whether I'm up, whether I'm down, peace on the inside of me. Why? Because you're generous. I've made generosity a priority in my life. See, when I make generosity a priority, listen to this. My perspective is adjusted. How many know sometimes we need a perspective adjustment? Because it's so easy to get so, so uh, wrapped up in our circumstances, the circle that we stand in, that we lose sight of what's happening outside of our deal. When I'm generous, God lifts my head up, softens my heart so I'm aware of the needs of the people around me. We got to be careful, church, that we don't desensitize ourselves to the needs and the hurts of those that we come in contact with. We, we, we got to be careful that when we're standing in Walmart and, and the Holy Spirit begins to press upon us as we're watching the single mom struggle with her four kids, she's got a pocket full of food stamps, and maybe God's leading on you to use your credit card, your debit card to take care of her bill, or maybe you're sitting at the gas station and a young man pulls up and his car's about to fall apart, he's got bumper stickers trying to hold it together, it's rattling, it's shaking, and you go over and you stick your card in. So you can take care of his gas. And you don't need to, you know, wax eloquent for 30 minutes about how God led you to do it. You just do it and walk away and let God do the rest. Just God, let God. See, that's what I mean about being desensitized. We got to be careful. And when I am generous, my head is lifted up. I can see the needs around me. And I can, re- and then God is able to work through me. The Philippian church understood that. Matter of fact, Paul even used them as an example to, to, to encourage the Corinthians to give because they knew there was a little bit of a rivalry there. They, they had both had basketball teams, and they got they, it's like Duke and North Carolina. It's like they were just going at each other. I'm from Virginia, so it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Here's the second thing is my generosity partners. When I'm generous, I connect with things that I would otherwise not be connected to. See, there's a, there's a blessing that's on Freedom House Church. I don't know if you know that or not. There's a blessing on this church. It ain't because of me, I can tell you right now. It ain't because of how cute my wife is either. And she's cute, I'm telling you right now. She's, she's not just cute, she's beautiful, gorgeous. So glad to be married to her. 
That's right. I'm working on it. I'm working on it right now. <laughs> this church is blessed. You know, the, when the economy dropped in 2008, we never missed a step. God continued to bless us. I never had to lay anybody off on the staff. We continued to move forward. We continued to move up. We never have ever in the history of this church ever had a downslide in any given year. It's God's blessing. Let, let, stop. Don't, don't clap. Wait, wait, wait. Because and this is what I want you to catch. My generosity, your generosity partners you with the blessing that's on this house. Because God said, if you'll build my house, I'll build your house. When you get under the covering of the blessing of God in regards to... Now, this, this, this goes with everything that we do as a church together. When we reach around the globe and we touch India with those wells and those churches, you get to partnership with that. When we, when we do things through the internet and see people's lives change, you get to partner with that. that you, you are connected with things and with people you will never meet in your entire life till you get to heaven because of your generosity, because of our sacrifice. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. In the Philippian church, every church that Paul went to, the Philippians were involved in the building of that ministry, in the expansion of the kingdom of God. And you and I are here today because of what the Philippian church did through Paul. Come on, come on. I mean, that's awesome. Think about the legacy you're going to build as a result of your generosity today in the Liberty Offering. Think about, think about it. You know, that, that clip with Oscar Schindler. He was the only German to ever be uh, buried in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you will see his, his, uh, his, his tombstone right there with stones all over as Jewish people come laying memorials at his stone because their lives were changed generation after generation because of what he did. Think about it. You are the one. Look at your neighbor. Say, you are the one. Look at him again. Say, you are the one. You are the one. Recognize that today. When, when I partner with God, when I partner with him, my generosity changes everything. Imagine, imagine those kids. I, I, just, I, I just was thinking about this today, this morning when I was praying for the service. I was just thinking about how powerful it will be in India when they go and they start pumping that little well and water starts coming out. They have traveled 40, 50 kilometers with buckets on their shoulders and now in their village... They have fresh water, clean water. Why? Freedom House Church. Why? Because of you. Because of you. And right next door is a church. Living water. Physical water. Awesome. I think about, you know, the 164 people that signed up for the tithing challenge last week. One of them, most in, his, in the history of our church, we've been doing it for many years, the most we've ever seen sign up for the tithing challenge. But one of them watches online. Maybe she's watching right now, and here's what she said. She sent me a little note. She said, on Sunday, I finally got an understanding of what it means to tithe. It's the whole purpose why we do what we do. And because of that, I'm going to take the tithe challenge. I'm not employed, but I do receive a small allotment each month that I will be tithing 10% off of. 10% off of. Thank you for showing me what life can be like when I place my eyes on God. Isn't that awesome? All because a church decided to get outside the box, do something different. We're reaching around. See, a person may never go to church ever. There's somebody that's watching today. They're never going to grace the doors of a church. I hope you do go to church somewhere. I hope you connect somewhere. But there may be somebody that's clicking on right now that may, may never step through the doors of a church. Maybe because they can't. But because of Freedom House Church, they're receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. My generosity, listen, my generosity is pleasing to God. Notice what Paul said. Paul said, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, verse 18, I've, having received from Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was a guy from the Philippian church. Now check this out. This is wild. He chased Paul down to give him the offering. Six weeks he followed him around, trying to find him because Paul was moving so quick. Epaphroditus would show up here and, where's Paul? Oh, he just left. Come on, most of us would quit after about two hours. God must not be in this one. See, generosity, why is it pleasing to God? Because generosity will never get you into heaven. You can't give your way into heaven. It's not, that, that's not the point of this. You can't. You can't give enough money. You can't buy your way into heaven. You, you're, you're not, we can't do enough good to get in heaven. 
No matter how good you are. Michael is good. And he's not good enough to get into heaven. Pastor Michael, he's good looking. He's got a good wife. <laughs> See, he's working on his dinner too. <laughs> but he's not good enough. There's only one way to get into heaven. Through grace, by faith. In what Jesus did. Because he was good enough. Jesus was good enough. He died for our sins. But see, generosity can't get you into into heaven, but generosity displays how much heaven is in you. That's a great great way to determine your spiritual temperature is by your generosity. Don't come at me saying how great of a Christian you are and you're stingy. Don't be telling me how much you know your Bible and how much you can pray and how much of a theologian you are and, and how great you are and how, how you can pray thus, thee, and thou and, 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 know, and quote and, and come to church and, and, and are stingy because that generosity is all about who we are as Christians. You want to display your, your, you want to display your Christianity at work? Give. Start by giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. If you can't give them any money, give them the benefit of the doubt. Right? How about giving them some forgiveness? It's all about generosity, isn't it? And that determines how much of heaven is on the inside of us. And that's pleasing to God. This is an acceptable sacrifice. I love 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's his grace. Here's what grace is spoken. He says, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes, that's me and you, he became poor that through his poverty we might become rich. Let me just sum that up in a very, very short. Jesus was temporarily poor so that you and I could be eternally wealthy. Let me say it again. Jesus was temporarily poor. We celebrate a man here 2,000 years later that was only alive for 33 and a half years. The average apostle lived to about 40 years old, and most of them were martyred. They were killed because of the cause. And we still, we're here because of that. I was, I'm 44 years old. Jesus was 33 and a half. My wife's 28 years old. I want a good dinner today. Wouldn't you agree that 33 and a half years is a pretty temporary life? And you and I now can experience eternal life because of what Jesus did. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be temporarily inconvenienced for the sake of someone else's eternal well-being? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to maybe sacrifice Hey, maybe you could just sacrifice Starbucks. I know, it's hard. It's hard to think about it. But you know, there's a machine at your house, I promise you, that's sitting in the corner. It's silver, black. It's called a coffee machine. You can go to the store and purchase Starbucks coffee and make it at home and save the $4.16 that you would spend on your extra sweet one pump, come on, Caramel, extra caramel, with foam, extra whipped cream, macchiato. <laughs> that you spend every day. I'm, I'm kind of making a joke. I'm trying to kind of make a joke about this. But the truth is, is that we all have something that we can temporarily inconvenience ourselves with. For the sake of someone else's eternal well-being. Think about that. And today, when you're about to give, think about that. Think about that generosity. Because... Let me tell you, Jesus paid an incredible price for you and me. Incredible price. But the Bible calls that a temporary price. He's experiencing eternal wealth. Let's do it, man. Come on, somebody say, you're the one. one. And here's the last thing I want to tell you today about the Philippian church is, is my generosity positions me. It positions me. Verse 19 says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Can I just tell you something, church? You can't quote that verse unless you're generous. Because everything about verse 19 
has to do with 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All of that, all of, all of me claiming the, the riches of God in my life, the supply that he has for my life has all to do with whether I'm generous or not. You can quote it all day long. You can yell at your internet screen that has your checking account up there. You can scream at your checkbook. You can yell at your wallet and my God shall supply all my need. Praise God. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can say it in the old southern gospel voice if you want to. <laughs> but the truth is it all comes as a result of positioning myself to have that need met. You know, I used to play softball because I wasn't good enough to play baseball. And so, uh, <laughs> and so I played uh, the infield. I was a pretty good infielder. I played second base, and then they moved me over to the shortstop. I was pretty good. I, 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 could, you know, I could turn a double play really good. We used to play with, against some honking big old guys. I mean, like, and, and sometimes we play in the church league. The church league ain't church. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> I played in some church leagues, and fights break out and everything like that. I'm like, come on, where's Jesus all up in this? They said, we left him at the church so we could play softball. <laughs> <laughs> So I just got involved with a, another team that wasn't involved in the church, and they were way more holy than the church team. But anyway, so I played, I played shortstop. One particular time when I was about 21 years old, I was right there at shortstop. And you need to be aggressive when you're at shortstop. You need, when the ball hits, you need to move quick. And the way this field was set, it kind of had a slope that went down and then went back up at the shortstop spot. And the ball that got, I mean, this big old, I mean, this guy had to be like 645 pounds, and he, he, he bat, batted right-handed. I'm a left-handed, but he batted right-handed. And he smacked, I mean, line drive, but it was one of those kind of those ones that kind of go like they knuckles at you. And so it's knuckling, and I'm going, whoa, yeah, like that. And it hits the ground, pops up, and breaks my nose. I mean, knocks me clean out. The thing, I woke up in the ambulance, you know, uh, knocked me clean out. Well, that was the end of my infield career as a softball player. Okay, I, I quit playing the infield, so they put me in the outfield. Now, because of how aggressive I was in the infield, I tried to take that into the outfield. And so every time the ball hit the bat, I immediately started running in. Now, if you know anything about baseball or softball, that's the worst thing you can do. Because immediately you have outpositioned yourself. And sometimes that people would hit, I'd immediately run back, and then I'd have to run forward. I finally figured out, somebody told me, he said, listen, Troy, when you play an outfield, when the ball strikes the bat, the best thing you can do is plant your right foot and just wait to see how it's going to come. See, listen, when I'm generous, when I'm generous, it positions me, not in front, not out back, but it positions me in the right place where God can meet every need. Notice it, not, notice it doesn't say needs, plural. It says need, because the need that God provides includes everything that you're going to deal with in your life. His sufficiency, his supply, everything he has for you. Why? Because it's, it's a result of my generosity. And so I, I'm there. I'm ready to catch the ball. That's my destiny. I'm ready to catch my future. And that's what we're going to do today. In just a second, we're going to give. We're going to, we're going to be generous so that we can position ourselves, so we can position our family, so we can position our church, so that we can position our, our way ready for God to move and, and promotions and, and gifts and inheritances and, and, and God moving through our businesses and moving in our church. Why? Because we're generous. And we're going to do it today. I don't know about you. I'm excited about the opportunity for, for God to, to, to position me to receive everything he has for me in my life. Everything that he wants to do in this church. Let, let it start right now. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? I want you to do something for me. Get, get a hold of the, these two things in your hand right now. And then we're going to do this. We're going to give. We're going to give big today. My wife and I, we've been praying about this offering. Every year we get so excited about liberty because we know every dollar represents a soul. Every, every dollar represents somebody coming out of jail, coming out of prison, the prisons of addictions, the prisons of divorce, the prisons of unforgiveness, the prisons of bitterness, the breaking the chains off. And my, my wife actually had a vision when we started this church that there was a pile of chains in the front of the church and everybody that came in were dropping their chains off at the front of the church. Powerful vision. And we're going to do that today. We're going to act by faith through our generosity. So there's an envelope. Everybody has an envelope. And then everybody has one of these cards. 
And so I want to give you some direction, and then we're going we're to worship God together. We're going to praise God as we're bringing this offering today. And so if you are giving today, you came prepared to give today. Maybe you came with cash or check or credit card. However you want to give right now in this moment, I want you to use this envelope. Make sure you fill it out so we can read it and all that good stuff. If you are planning to do a 30-day pledge, maybe you didn't come prepared today. Or maybe you know, like, I mean, a lot of people have to deal with this. is the way my wife and I are doing it. We're doing it over 30 days. Over the next four weeks, we're giving a certain amount every week. Well, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to use this commitment card. This just simply says that fill out your information at the top, put your email, it says, by faith I pledge to contribute, and then you fill in the blank. Maybe, maybe you're going to do $100 a week over the next week. You're going to do $1,000 a week over the, or $25, whatever. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to give more than God tells you to do, and don't give less than God. Do exactly what he tells you to do. Listen, don't get ahead of him. Don't get behind him. Get right there with him. Position yourself today. If you didn't come prepared today and you want to give online, can you do me a favor? Would you mind also filling this card out, this pledge card? Just fill this information out. Tell me, tell us what you're going to do on your online gift. Whether it's today or tomorrow or the week, whatever. And let's, let, let's, let's, do, let's make a difference. Let's make a difference. You're one of many. And together, together as a church, we're going to see lives changed. I don't know about you, I'm excited about that. I can't wait. Are you ready? Hold your offering, whatever form it's in, your, your commitment card. Hold it up in there. We're going to pray re- real quick, and then we're going to believe God. And then Pastor Clint's going to come and, and share what, how we're going to do this today. Come on. Father, we just thank you so much for your grace that's here, your, the spirit of the Lord that's in this place, God. Thank you, God, for blessing us so richly that we can give generously today in this place, God. We love you. We're so thankful, God. For, for the drawings, for this new children's facility, God. We're so thankful for the campuses that we're going to build around this, this area and get us ready for these future campuses of Freedom House Church. God, we're so thankful for our digital footprint, God, that we're going to expand, Lord, to reach more people through the internet. God, we are thankful for those four wells, those four churches in India, God. That, that, that we can experience the, the amazing, the amazing grace as we're generous, God. Because it's pleasing to you. It's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. Are you excited, church? Are you excited? Somebody shout amen. Amen. Come on, let's just praise him. Pastor Clint, tell us what to do next. All right, church, we can stand up together. We're going to give. We're going to bring our offering to the front. We have some containers here. Here's what I need you to do. Just follow the direction of the ushers. They will lead you row by row. As we sing, as we worship, as we celebrate liberty, you ready to do that? Follow the ushers row by row. Come on, let's praise him. Put your hands together.
chasing after all that you are. We are participate doing this, giving big to the vision God has as you leave today. We have this water bottle, Liberty 2013, that has all five initiatives, all the vision that we're pressing toward. You're going to get one of those today. Thank you so much. It's also a reminder. You can set it on your shelf. You can drink it. But remember the 30-day give and what we're pressing toward over the next 30 days. Okay, church? Thank you so much for participating today. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Woo!